Hey, this is Warren Redlick. Thank you for watching. I'm here with Dave Lee and Shogofa. Shogofa, how do you say your name? Shogofa. Yeah, Shogofa. Shogofa is a college student in British Columbia. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I go to uh, University of Victoria. Okay. I'm sorry, Uni University of British Columbia. Okay. And you have family in Afghanistan. Were you born in Afghanistan? Yeah, I was born and raised in Afghanistan um, in a province called Ghazni. And I was five when I moved to the capital city. But okay. I moved um, out of Afghanistan when I was 16. And I'm here with Dave Lee. Uh, Dave Lee probably needs no introduction, but he is a YouTuber that I aspire to be like in some ways. He's a much better interviewer than I am. Uh, we do different, to some extent, different styles of videos. But I was, I followed Dave on Twitter and I saw that he got involved with what I'll call the Afghanistan refugee problem. And as I understand it, Dave helped rescue dozens of people from Afghanistan. And Shogofa's family uh, has family members who were part of the people rescued. So Dave, can you tell us a little bit about what happened, how you got involved? Yeah, thanks, Warren. So the gist of it is, you know, it's kind of a story of Twitter and YouTube and uh, WhatsApp and a bunch of networking to do something that I had an inkling that we it was possible, but I wasn't sure. And so the gist of it was uh, last week when the Taliban took over, I tweeted, I said, I can't stop. I can't sit back and do nothing. I need to do something. Um, I want to make a difference in helping at least one person get out that wouldn't have gotten out otherwise. Like that's the key. And I'm willing to put 50,000 into it if you tell me where, okay? And so um, someone uh, DM'd me and said, I know some people, let's get on Clubhouse. He was from Afghanistan and he knew some people in Canada who were residents up there or students up there that had family back in Afghanistan and they had no idea what to do. In this Clubhouse, we had uh, two people, Fatima and Rabia come in, they share. And immediately after I said, let's do a YouTube interview. And I put it up on my channel from that YouTube video on my channel. So this is like the power of YouTube here and Twitter. Um, I get a contact who helps me to, to establish a presence in Pakistan to help people who was able to get us access to um, something called a border crossing agent which helps people cross the border. But this is all legal stuff here. They just kind of take the people to the border, take their luggage, like tell them instructions and tips and stuff and meet them on the other side of the border and take them to, uh, to the next city in Pakistan. But you need you need an agent, basically. Um, it's not illegal, but you know, but these families, they had limited amount of money and knowledge, so they couldn't make the trek themselves. So basically I spent the whole week, um, the early part of the week, DMing people on Twitter, researching, where are there any open land borders? Because the reality was, as I'm doing research, these families don't have the best chance getting out of Kabul in the airport. They don't have the deepest government connections or something. They weren't interpreters for you know, the US military. Um, they're ethnic and religious minorities, and there are lots of young children, women, and various other risk factors, but they weren't things that the US government was like particularly interested in. So I knew that they had to be an alternative route. And so on Twitter, I'm going crazy. This is like on Friday night, Saturday night, I'm messaging a bunch of people, where are their open borders? Any person that's leaving the country, I'm like, how'd you get out? When'd you get out? You know, all this stuff. And I find from four sources, there is one open border, right? And it's to Pakistan that very few people are talking about. Almost no one is talking about it on Twitter. But I confirm it through multiple sources on the ground, through my networks. I tell the um, Shogofa's two friends immediately, let's get your families down because it's open. And we have the contact in Pakistan who will provide, you know, the agent stuff, we'll provide the funding. Let's make it happen. It takes a couple days for their families to, to organize, to, you know, travel. They start to get on their way and they tell Shogofa, who's one of their, their best friends up there in Vancouver and a couple other people, they start contacting me. And so now we got this train this train of families going down to the border area, right? And everything is set up where we're learning on the fly, but they're on their way, you know, they're getting their taxis. And then we got a problem. So Shogofa's family, like, I think it was like on Sunday, they went to get bus tickets for the next day. They get their bus tickets and then they uh, pack their things. The next day they go to the bus station and then Shogofa, tell, tell us what happens to your family at the bus station there. Um, so the next day when they went to the bus station, I'm not really too sure exactly what happened because I haven't gotten the chance to like sit down with my parents and talk about like the whole journey. But 
um, my dad called me immediately and he was like, 303 and 404 buses that leaves from Kabul to Kandahar are not working anymore. So we have to find um, a different car or like a different route to get to uh, Kandahar. So I think he rented a private car, but because it happened right, like the changes with the 303, 404 buses happened right, um, like that day, they had to like pay a lot of money to rent a car and get themselves to Kandahar. They rented a car and they got themselves to Kandahar that day. I think the journey took them 14 hours to get from Kabul to Kandahar and from Kandahar when they got to Kandahar, they stayed in a motel for a day, for one night. And then the next day was the plan for them to leave, cross the border and get to Pakistan. Yeah. See, um, finances is a big part because um, they used up almost all their money renting a taxi because it was it's 10 times more pricier. Think about it, a 13-hour ride with seven people than a bus. Plus, they were price gorging, pay, like charging five times the amount at that time. So they're, they're almost out of money but trying to get to the border. So we've got this train going and we have Shagofa and Fatima Rabia, the first two, and then we have a couple other people in this WhatsApp group with our Pakistan contacts and myself, and we're problem shooting on the fly. Like, where do, they, where do you stay tonight? Shagofa's like, what hotel? You know, and what agent? And then our, our initial agent contacts fall through. So we, the day before they're leaving to the airport, or leaving to the border at the Kandahar uh, hotel, we're having to find new people. And so we're frantically on this WhatsApp chat with like multiple countries all over the place, DMing other people that get information. And so, um, Shagofa, what happens like with the, the, the border agent? Like, how did your family find someone last minute? I think there was a different agent that was supposed to help my family, but he was not responding. So my dad actually got to know someone at the motel and he was telling me about him. But I told him to go with the first agent because... Um, other people who actually crossed the border had experience with him and we didn't know if the agent that he found was um, reliable and then when he didn't find when he didn't contact my dad um, they were like supposed to leave um, so they he he went back to him and he was like we, we need your help we need to get to Kwaita um, so this guy was probably like um, I don't like working at the hotel or maybe just like taking a break um, and that's how he got to know him at the uh, border I mean at um, in Kandahar and yeah he like basically arranged everything uh, from there got with it the, uh, yeah with the agent yeah got it so um so Gofa's family is actually seven people um, that are crossing so her parents and four younger siblings and their grandfather grandfather right or grandmother well, actually it's five uh, of my siblings my dad and my mom Oh, okay. So, okay. So it's five siblings. A different family. That's uh, seven. Oh, and that's right. have, uh, sorry, sorry, maybe. Sorry. Um, five siblings. What are their ages? They're 14, uh, 12, 9, uh, 7, and the other one is four. What is your relationship like with them? Like typically, are you, how often are you talking with them? Like uh, typically well, before? When I, yeah. Be before they left, I used to talk to them to like um, every two days with my uh, siblings and my parents. Uh, I do have a really, really close relationship with all of them. But fun fact, I actually haven't seen my uh, four-year-old four -year brother because he was born uh, five months after I left Afghanistan. And I haven't been back home since then. So, uh, but even with that, like, even though we haven't seen each other, we have like a really, really close relationship. If uh, Every time I talk to him, he's like, you're my sister. <laughs> I don't know if he knows what a sister means, but he does um, think that I'm his sister. So yeah, yeah. Um, so we, the first day we try your family, um, can, you, can you share like kind of how many people got through the first day and how many so people- So the first, yeah. yeah, the first day, my family was planning to leave with Maya's family, but for some reason it didn't work out and I still, yeah, it didn't have, like, they have to, like, go in smaller groups. And we were planning for uh, my, uh, for my family to, like, divide in groups of three. So two of my siblings go with, like, one adult, the other two go with another adult, and, like, um, the rest of them go together. But because it was their first time, like, crossing the border, they didn't, re they didn't really know what to do. So they went as a group, and because it's, um, there's like multiple gates that you have to cross, like first gate, second gate, and third gate. 
and the first and second gate is like easier to cross even though there is a high chance of getting back uh, getting sent back but the third gate is where it gets a bit more challenging so my family I think they all crossed the first and the second gate but when they got to the third gate they were sent back and they tried it again they were sent back again they tried it again they were sent back again that first day they tried four times and they got sent back four times and I think um, obviously part of it is because of um, like the group, like it was a huge group of seven people. They should have um, went in smaller groups, but also part of it is because of you coming from a minority background and um, not having that privilege that m other people might have. Um, sure. And yeah. Yeah, being a Hazara, they could spot you and tell you, you know, you're an ethnic and religious minority and discriminate. Um, it's hard too. You have said it's your it's your mom and your dad and four siblings, but these are four year old like to fourteen year old. You're talking about young kids, so in order to split into a smaller group, I mean, you're talking about your mom has to take half, your dad has to take half, or something, or they have to give it to some other person, maybe another family, maybe that you know is crossing. Um, yeah, sorry, thinking? I'm just gonna make a comment about that because it was their first day crossing the border. So even though the plan for them was to get to like cross the border in smaller groups or like uh, hand in two or like three of my siblings to another family, because they thought it was easier to cross the border, they wanted to stay as a family and cross the border as a group and like not try to like uh, go in smaller groups. But the second day, cause okay. So the first day they tried four times and they decided um, to go back the next day because um, um, you have to you get to try it like every couple of hours um, so by the end of the day they didn't have like another chance to cross the border again so they went back to the motel and the next day they tried it again so this time uh, they tried it again as a group they couldn't find um, a family to cross the border with or like try to like divide in groups of um, in smaller groups. So they crossed the border again, first and second gate. And again, at the third gate, they were sent back again on their second day, the first day, uh, second day, first try. And uh, my mom actually was very sick when she was leaving Kabul because she was sick and she also had car sick, got car sick, and she was not doing really well. So the second day when she, she when they were sent back, my, my dad called me and she he was like, uh, your mom doesn't want uh, to, she, she says, I'm, I don't think I can do it anymore um, because I think she was not physically able to do it anymore. Like even though she really wanted to, the heat, the, uh, the dust and the unsanitary um, like situation at the border made, uh, made more people like their situation, their health a lot worse than what it used to be or like what it was, especially with my mom. And so they were, they went back and then they were, um, and my mom, my dad was like, okay, let's sit, take a break. And then we will try it again. If it doesn't work out, we will think of a different way uh, to get to the other side. So they were actually planning. Um, they were sitting in a corner. I think four of my siblings were also sick. They had fever, a little bit of fever. And they were sitting in a corner and this guy comes up to them um, and he is from a different ethnic group. He is Pashtun and my family is Hazara. And he comes up to them and tells my dad, like, I think he sees the situation and how like everyone is like not doing well. And he comes up to him and is telling them um, about like, why are you not crossing the border? And my dad basically like tells the whole story to him. And so he decides um, to take four of my siblings and my mom uh, with him to help them cross the border. Um, and so two of my siblings are on one side and then two other ones on, our other, on his other side. And then my mom is also like, I step away from them. So he basically takes them as his family to help them cross the border. So um, they pass the first gate, they pass the second gate and they pass the third gate. Um, but when they get to the third gate and my, 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 uh, brother, my 12, my 12 year old brother and my dad is also following them, but they, they try to like stay a bit far away from them so that they don't think that they are a group. But when they get to this third gate, 
um, three of my siblings, no, two of my siblings with my mom and with the other man, they get to pass. But the, uh, the, uh, the guards at the border, they stop my 14 year old sister with my um, eight year old brother and they try to send her back. And that's where um, my, my sister starts uh, shout shouting my mother, my mother in Pashto. Um, and when I was talking to her later, she was like, yeah, I, start, I started saying um, in Pashto, Zima Mor, and it was the only uh, Pashto word that I could remember at that time. Because we told her that, like, try to like speak Pashto if you can um, at the border. And so I think, uh, she started shouting twice, my mom, my mom, and I think the border guard let her cross. And also because she had a burqa on, they probably couldn't see her face. So they were like, okay, let's <laughs> let her cross the border. And so she crossed the border with my, uh, with everyone else. They got to the other side. And, uh, and then my dad and my 12 year old brother is again, sent back from the third gate. And then my dad calls again and he's like, everyone else is on the other side. Your mom doesn't have a phone. Um, she has the contact information of these people, but you have to find a way for them to get to um, these people. And so um, I make, I, we were on WhatsApp group. We were trying to like talk to each other to see who can help who and like what to do. And, um, and I think it took, like I can't remember exactly, probably like three, four hours or like two hours. Um, yeah, around that like range to like figure out where they are and if they cross the border or not, because we had to like contact agents and stuff. And um, yeah, and then they they were taken from the border to Kwaita and they stayed uh, there for like a night. But my dad and my mom, no, my, my dad and my 12 year old brother, they were in Afghanistan still. And my dad was like, we will try it again in the afternoon. If it doesn't work out, we will try it again tomorrow morning. And they tried it in the afternoon. It didn't work out. And so they decided to stay another night at the motel. And then on the third day, uh, they, they tried it again in the morning. Mm -hmm. And this time they were sent back again. <laughs> they were sent back again. And um, actually on the third day, uh, they were sent back. Um, again the first time and then the second time they were trying to cross um i my brother i told my dad that if they send if they allow uh, my brother to cross the border let him cross uh, don't try to like take him like bring him back with you there will be a way for you to leave but if one person crosses the border there might not be a chance for that person to cross the border again even if it is a kid, like you have to let them cross because what are you going to stay? What are you going to do if you stay behind, if you stay back? Um, even if you're alone, you have to take that risk. And you, so many children are actually taking that risk. So my brother crossed the border on his own because at the third gate, the agents, uh, I mean, the, uh, the guards, they sent back my dad. They sent my dad. And my brother was the only person who got to cross the border on the third day. And my dad immediately called me again. And he was like, try to find your brother because he is alone on the other side. And there's tens and tens and like thousands of people trying to find, because on the other side, there's only agents and you have to be able to find your own agent. You have to have their contact information and ask them to come and pick you up and bring you to Kwaita. But he doesn't have a phone number. And he's only 12. Um, and my dad was like, okay, so he's wearing black clothes. He's wearing a, a Kandahari cap. Um, he is wearing black shoes. He also has a backpack, um, like, uh, like a laptop backpack. And he has two bottles of water. Um, and yeah, like he has the contact information of these people. And he apparently, when he got to the other side of the border, he found, he, he took someone else's phone to like call my dad to let him know that he crossed the border and that he needs like help, like someone picking, like trying to like come and pick him up. And we again on WhatsApp group were trying to like find a way to, um, to like find my brother, but uh, because it was a bit challenging with him because he's young and with my parents when they crossed, it was a little bit easier because 
um, like my, my mom was there, my sister was there and, and they could like help a little bit and they were able to find the agents, but my brother couldn't. So he stayed there for four hours and then we were trying to find him, but we, uh, and then we were like, we were not able. And then I get a call um, like from one of the people that helps, uh, that was helping, like was trying to help find my brother. And he was like, your dad was also able to cross the border and they have found each other on the other side. But this is four hours later when, um, after like my brother crossed the border. And yeah, they, they, I think they are all like together now um, but they, they crossed, they crossed, um, they have been together since two nights ago, or actually maybe one night, but I haven't been able to talk to them because they don't have, like, I don't have their contact information yet. So, um, I, yeah. I'm an American. I've never been to Afghanistan. I've never been to Pakistan, India, really anywhere close. And I think a lot of Americans don't understand what life is like in Afghanistan and why you would flee. Why, what was it about what was happening? I understand there's the Taliban are taking over, but we don't really understand in America what the Taliban are, what Hazara are, what Pashtun are. What was the, what was happening in Afghanistan that made your family feel like they needed to flee? And how, how did whatever was happening affect your family? First of all, I wanna say, that this war happening in Afghanistan is impacting everyone, no matter if you're a Hazara, a Pashtun, but the, the extent to which it impacts minorities, be there, either be religious or ethnic minorities, uh, women, um, the LGBT community, um, children, I feel like they are at a greater risk of being impacted. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, you asked about why my family wanted to leave. I think people want to live. And if you stay behind, that's not guaranteed. And they have hopes, they have dreams for their future to fulfill. And I feel like if you have hope, if you have dreams um, for a better future, then you are going to try to find a way to actually leave that country. But people who are staying behind, it's not that they don't have dreams, but some people are privileged enough, like my parent family, um, to have my support and to have the community that we have created to be able to help them out. So even though my parents were able to leave um, to have a better future, so many people are actually staying behind. And um, I hope that we don't forget about them. What, what bad things do you anticipate happening to the people who are left behind? We've seen wars before where the winning party starts killing everyone that they don't like. Is it is there's a perception that there's going to be what we would call a genocide? Is it a mistreatment? Is it suppression of your ability to live your life the way you want to live your life? What is it exactly that your family feared? And what do you fear for the people, who, for the Hazara who remain? Women and children have made a lot of progress in the past 20 years. And I feel like that's like a lot of girls are not going to be able to have the opportunity to go to school anymore. And ethnic and religious minorities, including the Hazara people, are at a higher risk of being persecuted and killed and marginalized in the country. So these are just like, like one of the only, like the a few things among many of other things that will happen to people in Afghanistan. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about what, it, what does it mean to be Hazara? Uh, where did your family live? You know, is there, is there a Hazara community? Where is the Hazara community? And, and what's life like before, uh, you know, during the past 20 years? What, what, obviously, you left a few years ago, but how, how, what is life like there before all this recent turmoil? Well, I feel like um, I was born and raised in a village in Ghazni. And um, it's like the area where all the Hazara people live, central highlands of Afghanistan, it's called Hazarajad. But when I was five years old, my parents decided to move to the capital city because of um, the, because they wanted me to get an education and we didn't have that opportunity. We didn't have that in our village. So we moved to the capital city so that I could go to school. And when we moved to the capital city, um, we 
move to the west of Kabul, which is a place highly um, dominated, I mean, lived where a lot of Hazara people live um, um, in west of Kabul. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty segregated city, um, like so many other cities here in North America too. But yeah, like if um, Hazara people live in one area, they try to like stick to, to their own community. Um, other ethnicities have their own communities. And, uh, but you also like are gonna find people that live um, in different areas of the uh, city as well. I feel like we don't appreciate what we have. We don't understand how much people in other countries don't have. What are some of the things that you see in the United States or Canada that we have that people in Afghanistan or Pakistan don't have? We have security here. We have a place to stay at. We have access to food. We have access to water. We have access to education. And these are things that not a lot of people can afford back home. I mean, I would guess maybe transportation. It sounds like transportation is very difficult in oh, yeah, Afghanistan. Transportation. <laughs> I'm very lucky to have trains and uh, buses here because they're super fast back home. We had to like, we, we had mini buses. We, we used to call them mini buses and they would get really, really, really packed. And so a lot of times you had to like walk from one destination to the other like area where you wanted to get to. We used to, I remember when I was younger and the United States was in a cold war with the Soviet Union, people from the Soviet Union would come to the United States, Russia for people who aren't old enough to know what the Soviet Union was. They would come to the United States and they would take them to a grocery store and the Russians thought it was fake. They didn't <laughs> think that it was real. So was it a surprise to you the first time you went into an American grocery store? It was, uh, actually, when I was back home, I really, really wanted to experience going into a grocery store be just before to have like to push the cart. <laughs> but I think I was more excited, but I was not surprised. I was not like, oh, wow, this is so interesting. This is cool. I was just like, I, I was I was just looking forward to the experience to have the opportunity to push the cart at least once. <laughs> and, okay. <yeah. laughs> It sounds crazy, I know. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, my impression is that if you go into a, if you want to buy food in Afghanistan, they don't have stores that have, you know, a hundred different kinds of shampoo and, mm -hmm. you know, so many different kinds of, of different foods and drinks and so many other things. Is that, is the, the, the abundance that you see in a store in America surprising or were you already aware that we had that or is, am I under, am I, Am I being unfair to Afghanistan? Is do our stores in Afghanistan also have similar abundance? Well, I think we have similar abundance back home too. It really depends on if you can um, like provide that, afford it. Yeah. Uh, we don't have big stores over there. We do have, they have been recently made, um, but it like depends on which part of the city you live. It's obviously in areas where a lot of rich and privileged people live. But in areas where it's mostly poor um, people and people that can't afford that luxury, they, they don't have access to those kind of stores. Um, we have like tiny stores, we call them Dukan. And they're basically like, like a tiny grocery store where you can go and like get all of the supplies um, that you need. Um, but yeah, um, about the abundance and I I, under, I don't understand the different varieties of like, I don't know, milk and, <laughs> and like, uh, like, I don't know, chips and all of these. Um, yeah, I, I, there's too many uh, of them at the superstore, like too many brands. I, that's something I can't understand. <laughs> I want to ask you specifically, you were describing this problem at the border with the three gates and you said your mother and your siblings were getting sick. Can you Describe me, I don't know if you can describe because you weren't there, but can you provide a little more detail? What, what was unsanitary or unclean near the border that was making people sick? Um, so I think it was the second day when my dad called me and his voice was so, so like different. Um, he was not able to talk properly. Um, he was like coughing a lot. And I asked him if he was okay. And then I talked to my mom. She also had the same like voice. Her voice was totally different. And, and, and my dad was like, um, it's very unsanitary here. Like, 
um, the washroom, there's only one washroom and 1000 people use that one washroom. And it's, it's very, very, like very, like it's not clean at all. Uh, he, he was saying, this is a bit uh, to my, uh, uh, too much information, but my, um, my siblings didn't actually use the washroom for three days because they were like, we can't go, we can't use that washroom. Is it like people are using the floor to go to the bat to to pee and poop is that what we're talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what i that's what my dad told me okay. and also the hotels are really really like it's not clean at all like in one room it's not like one family rents one room they try to like pack the room and try to like uh, give space to as many people as they possibly can because there is thousands of people at the border and there's not enough um, uh, space for them to stay at. So okay, and it's not like spring break where they're giving everybody alcohol and it's a party. I mean, yeah, we could we could try to provide that for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's what you should have done, Dave. Um, <laughs> and, and, I need you to 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 volunteer to go there for me. <laughs> and and I, I'm not sure that the the Taliban would have appreciated bringing alcohol into the country. But <laughs> can you can you explain this? Th I don't understand the three gates. What where where is there a gate on the Afghanistan side, a gate on the Pakistan side, and a gate in the middle? What what does the three gates mean? I, I don't understand what that means. I don't exactly know about the details either, but I know that the gate on the Afghanistan side is um, controlled by uh, the Taliban. Am I right, Dave? I don't know. Uh, it, it seems like you have an Afghanistan side and a Pakistan side. Um, and then they agree to certain rules or so, for example, they have certain things of which type of people with which requirements can be allowed through the border. And so Pakistan or Afghanistan side will check those people and then Pakistan on their side will check. And then you have another gate in between, you know, um, and at any point they can reject you and you have to go back to the other side. Right. So that's kind of the. Yeah. Yeah. The okay. thing is, they even if you have the right um, documents to cross the border, they don't look at your documents. They look at which, which ethnic background you belong to. Um, and that's where the problem is. Um, and it's actually changing every day. So yeah. yeah, every day it's getting harder and harder and less and less people are able to get through. They're making it more strict and stringent. Um, yeah, so it's... Um, yeah, our Shikofa's family really was lucky, even though they, they, they did three days. I'm glad they all got through, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, because um, my dad was telling me, like, every time I was talking to them, he was saying something new because it was like changing every it, the possibility of them changing the rules was like really high. So, OK, so your your family's in Pakistan now. Maybe we don't need to say exactly where they are, but what are the conditions where they are now? I haven't been able to talk to them since they crossed to Pakistan because they didn't have a SIM card. And I talked to them a bit, like five minutes this morning, um, just to like see if they are all together. But yeah, I haven't been able to talk to them yet. But I know I heard from other friends of mine that, uh, that live here on the other side of the border, a lot of people do not have access to shelter. They do not have access to food. They do not have access to water. So um, they're not in the best, like they don't, they, 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 they do need support. And a lot of like housing, um, housing is not a, um, like, um, sorry, housing is not affordable. Um, it's very, the prices are really high right now. And there's, even if there is a place um, that they could rent, um, there's actually not enough space for them to rent. People are right now, like if they're staying at mosques, at wedding halls, um, anywhere that they can possibly like uh, find a place to stay at for um, some time. Okay, I wanna ask both of these. I'm gonna ask Dave this question first. What can people do to help, Dave? What, you know, people yeah. who are watching this right now, but yeah. you obviously were, were taken by this story. As, as far as I understand, you're actually traveling right now. You're not even, you're like on vacation, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm on it. Yeah, I'm on vacation, but. But I mean, not, this, this, not this really on vacation. <laughs> no, but this caught you so much that you have yeah. decided to put all this time and effort into something when, yeah. you know, so what, but now, so, so we're, we're where we are now. 
what do you see that people can do to help? Yeah, so I'll, I'll connect the dots here. So um, I'm, I was able to kind of have a deeper connection because I've traveled the world extensively. And I've been to places like North Korea, Iraq, Iran, Syria. Um, I've been to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Like I, I met people in these areas. And I remember in Afghanistan, like, like some of the most cutest kids I've ever seen in my life. You know, like three year old girl sitting there, like with no, like literally, like no sanitation, just, but they're so, they're, their eyes have the, a strength and a warmness that it's like, it, it just, that connection is there. And so when this Taliban thing happened, I'm like, oh, I know exactly what's gonna happen. Cause I've been in so many countries in so many regions. It's so obvious to me. It's like, it's, I just see the writing in the wall. I see the next five, 10, 20 years, almost like a, a, a picture. I see almost the strategy of the Taliban, like I'm in their mind because I've seen so many different countries and how the governments exercise their things and how they're different too. But I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like we have one week. We have one week opportunity to get some people out and it could radically change their life before the Taliban start to crack down more and more. Every month it's like a virus. They're just going to ex ex expand their control. They're going to be taking away education. They're going to be taking away freedom. They're going to take away media. They're going to take away a lot of different things. It's going to get harder and harder. Um, this one week, we have a chance. Every day from the beginning of the week, we're going to lose the opportunity. And so anyways, that was the gist of my urgency. But in terms of how people can help the situation, number one is there's a fallacy that people think they can't do anything. It's like this widespread thing. I, I don't understand it. It's like, it, um, that's the one thing that stops almost everyone from doing anything. That's one thing. Second thing is this, is um, um, right now we have Shagofa's family, but some of her best friends who I've helped and we've, we were part of this group that's coordinating all this, their families are now stuck in Pakistan. And it's and they're doing their best to support them and to find a way. Shagofa is a Canadian permanent resident. You know, she's a student at the University of British Columbia. Like, she, like the government should try to help her to bring her dependent children. These are siblings. There's her siblings are dependent on her for everything right now. For their right. life, for their everything, literally, right? Um, they, they have no nothing out there. And so I guess our, my kind of call to action is, A, if there's anyone out there who could, and I, I can't tell people and hold their hands what to do, but there's some people out there who have connections in Canada with government, with organizations, they can move things, right? And Shagofa's younger siblings are stuck right now. They just got out. This is like less than 48 hours news. This is just happening. Um, but you think that you can't do anything. You think one tweet doesn't matter. But your tweet, one tweet gets 100 retweets and it, it picks up on somebody that, you know, can help. I mean, this is how the world works today. It works in these like connected ways. I don't think people completely understand how much impact they have. Like seriously, my YouTube channel and my Twitter account, you know, and with the addition of extra finances, you know, that I've put in and experience and stuff, it's, it's crazy, the impact. And um, yeah, I think people minimize the stuff that they're able to do. And I think Shagofa's family here is just evidence of like, wait a minute, we live in a different world. This is not 1980 or, you know, 30 years ago. We're in a connected world where we can move things together if we start believing that we can do something about it. And I want to actually thank you, Warren, for putting this on because I'm like, I'm putting up an offer. I'm saying we need help. We need to get the story out. And this isn't particularly 100% related to investing. I think it is in a sense because uh, I think because I was able to, to, to say, hey, I'm going to put down 50,000 to any effort that can seriously help one person that wouldn't have been able to, to get out. Right. Um, I, I put this tweet out like last week. And the only reason I'm able to do that is because 50,000 for me is it's like, it doesn't mean anything to me. Like it, it, it meaning in the sense where it doesn't change my lifestyle and I can't even notice it because it's like, it's not even one, it's like not even close to 1% of, of assets for me. And the only way that I got there was through investing. Right. And, and that's the power of investing too, is you can get to a place to have resources where you, you can make bold bets to help people, yeah. you know, and do things that are kind of crazy, but can work out and change a person's life or generations for many years to come. So it's related to investing, but yeah, I appreciate actually Warren, you taking, you know, yeah, I, I want to ask Shagofa, you've heard what Dave said. What do you think people can do to help? 
uh, help your family, help the families of your friends. Maybe there's other people that need help. What's the first thing or first couple of things that come to your mind that we can do to help? Yeah, I do resonate with a lot of things that they've talked about and especially um, people think that they can do anything to help people, to help Afghanistan and to help refugees who are um, who have left Afghanistan. Um, and the past two weeks, honestly, like three weeks, I have been very, very frustrated and exhausted because I either like because I have been trying to prove to people either directly or indirectly to that the Afghanistani diaspora, they don't need they don't they can't live the rest of their lives in limbo, not knowing if they can see their families back home or if they can reunite with their families. And I don't think children in Afghanistan or um, kids who have been displaced because of the situation back in Afghanistan deserve to live the rest of their lives, not knowing if they will ever get the opportunity to go to school, to have all the rights that they had, um, which they, they, they should have as kids. Um, so I think that we can do a lot even if you feel like you can, there's so much out there that we can do. Um, as people who have the opportunity, because we have the resources, we are privileged enough to amplify their voices. And I feel like um, reaching out to like your MPs, uh, trying to write letters to them um, and also asking them to change the uh, policies around the resettlement, um, Re, the resettlement program, um, because the resettlement program, it only um, allows people uh, to bring, like to reunite people that uh, meet certain requirements. Um, and a lot of people actually don't. So that's something that um, people and also the government can work on. And what, one last thing also um, is um, the more that like, people can help like Shagofa. And I'm also putting an interview up or, um, with her friend Samaya, whose families just came out. But we have like five families here that um, they have they have amazing stories. And there's something about like having their younger siblings, like needing their help. And three of them are permanent residents of Canada. And I think um, I want to get them on more media stuff like YouTube, but also TV or articles. We, like anything could help right now. They're willing to to share, you know, to to help, and so that's another kind of call to action. Are there are there particular members of the Canadian? It's, this is a. I think you're describing this as a Canadian problem. For both you and I, our audiences are primarily U.S., but Canada is my number two country. It's probably your number two country in the audience. Um, are there particular parts of the Canadian government that are? It's more important that they hear this story particular members of parliament or particular agencies within the Canadian government? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think a lot of it in chaos, it's, it, the reality is personal connections because like the rules haven't been established completely. And so um, they don't know who Shagofa is or their family. And so we've emailed them, like Shagofa emailed them, uh, Canadian in a couple of the, the, the places saying we need evacuation, we need help, whatever, but they don't know who she is or they don't resonate in a sense where no one's telling them, you know, help this family, right. they're going right. to set up the, the protocol, they're going to set up the process, but it's kind of bureaucratic and slow. And Canada is actually at the forefront. They've put aside 20,000 spots and they're going to set up the process. And a Shagofa's family, because she's a permanent resident, they'll have priority in that process, but it hasn't even started yet, the, the applications for that special program. So we're talking about, it could be months, if not years, before Shagofa's family can be reunited with her. But that's- and in, that, and in that time, they're stuck in like a refugee camp in Pakistan, probably. Well, not, not necessarily. I'm gonna, we're gonna do, we're gonna make sure they, they get, you know, basic, like Shagofa is, that's, that's her kin, you know? They're not gonna be stuck in a refugee camp. They'll be, they're in a city and they're gonna have to find, you know, a place to live and manage their way, you know, in a city, yeah. basically. I mean, they're lucky. They're, Shagofa's family is lucky, she, they have her. You know, I mean, there are a lot of others who don't have, you know, outside family members, you know, advocating for them. But yeah, the U.S. surprisingly, um, 
you know, their focus is on more the SIV or it's called a special immigrant visa for um, people who've helped the US military, you know, interpreters and stuff. They don't really have much capacity or much things for other people, um, whether it's ethnic minorities or, you know, other kind of groups. And so there's other countries, but because of the five people that we helped were from Canada, um, we figure, and they have probably the, the most kind of open slash um, um, helpful policies. Um, it's great. It's just going to take re in a regular process. It might take months and not years to get your GoFo's family over. But if our, if our YouTube and Twitter folks, both your channel, my channel, others can help out, maybe we could speed up this process and bring it down to weeks, you know, and, if we could find the right people. And for those of us, for the, for the Americans in the audience, other than spreading the word on Twitter, is there, is there something that we can do for maybe we can't do anything for these families to get them to Canada. Is there something we can do for other people to influence the American government or otherwise help people get here yeah. or somewhere else? Yeah. So my, I can, I have a completely crazy, like, or different approach. My approach is kind of this, um, rather than looking at the problem as this huge problem of millions of people and how can we help this million person problem? My whole thing is let's personalize it and get to know one person and help that person from A to Z. And then we can replicate that with another person we get to know. So it's a very relational, personal issue here. So the whole thing is kind of like, um, there are millions of people to help, but if we could actually help one family from, for example, get from Kabul to Pakistan, we can replicate it, right? And actually we helped not just their group, but another partnering organization with a hundred plus more people because we're able to share the information and say, here's the formula, right? So if we can help Shagofa's family quickly get from Pakistan to a safer place and we establish that route and that connections, then we can share that information and help more and more people, you know, get quicker, get to a safer place, you know, um, faster. So that's the whole idea. And that's why I'm like, let's focus on one person at a time. And okay. um, anyone in the US who's watching, just forward this, e this video to anyone you know in Canada, have them watch it. They need that connection first, you know? And then they go, oh my gosh, okay, Shagofa, I know you, I feel like I know you. And wait, how old, you have a four-year-old? Is it? Similar? Yeah, I do have a four-year-old brother, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. She's never seen that. And then there's like completely in a foreign country just 48 hours ago. And um, yeah, so it's, it's this thing of people need to say, oh, I know Shagofa now, you know? Right because they know Warren, they know Dave or something, and right. now they know Shagofa. It's like, okay, fine, I, now we gotta do something for this another person I know, right? And then um, the, the dominoes start to, to fall and we start to get some action. Like that's kind of what needs to happen. Okay, so Dave, you were talking about all this technology that helped. I wanted to ask you for, for you and I both have people who watch us who would ask, who, who are probably thinking this, did Bitcoin ever come into play? You're trying to get money from point A to point B. Bitcoin can be very good for transferring value across country lines did it come up at all bitcoin or any other crypto yeah. um bitcoin crypto i was thinking about it multiple times a day i was trying lots of stuff to get it in um bitcoin and crypto it failed and and gave me hope at the same time um nobody in the country that we found would take crypto and trans and, and change it for cash because cash was like the banks weren't open um everyone was hoarding whatever they had you're because, talking about you're talking about afghanistan now not pakistan afghanistan. Yeah, in Afghanistan. So we had to find alternative ways to get some money into the country to help some of the families that needed money to get out. So that said, crypto failed in that sense. But a lot of the stuff we're doing, I'm like, oh my gosh, if we had crypto and everyone had a wallet and we were changing, exchanging stuff and we could move property rights and different stuff, like it would be a different complete um, process to, to do. Um, so crypto in some senses is hopeful, but yeah, it failed in this particular experience. It's not us. there yet. Yeah, by far. Okay. Um, anything else that you think people need to hear, Dave? No, I mean, I, I think um, it's just, I wanna give actually, you know, I just wanna say, this is awesome. The the age we live in, like you can look at it in different ways. You get all depressed at all the problems all around the world. Another way you could say, oh my gosh, we're all connected. We've got WhatsApp, we've got Twitter, we got YouTube. Anyone can make a video who's determined. You know, we can connect with each other. We can make relationships. The whole world is is a completely different world than 10 or 15 years ago. And people are still trying to get used to that. But the hope or the reality is we could cause a huge amount of positive 
action and benefit if we know what we're doing, right? So that I mean that's one thing. And then the other thing is just like, yeah, um, uh, this is this is happening. You know, we're doing it. We're making it happen, right? You know, we're not sitting back. And um, Shikofa's family and others, um, yeah, the doors are opening, and I can't wait. To, see, that's the thing. My hope right now is like when Shikofa gets to meet her four-year-old brother, you know, in yeah. Canada, and gets to hug him and say, "You're you're safe." You know, yeah. you have you have opportunity now. Like that's that's gonna be you know, um, yeah. make everything worth it. Yeah. Shogofa, I have something I want to say at the end, but Shogofa, is there anything you want to say before I speak? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you um, for using your platform uh, to amplify our voices. And I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to get to know um, Dave and also had the opportunity to get to talk to you both about my story. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I just want to say, first of all, repeating what Dave said, please share this with anyone you know in Canada. Uh, you know, if you know, if you know anyone who is a member of parliament, who's in the Canadian government, please share this with them. One thing I wanted to say is I, I have a, I, Dave probably knows I get very outspoken on politics on Twitter and I encounter a lot of anti-immigration sentiment. And a lot of the messaging is, oh, everyone from Afghanistan is a terrorist. Or, you know, there's, there's a lot of demonization, a lot of negative imagery that is cast on people coming from other countries. And there's this perception that somehow there's this threat to the American way of life or probably the Canadian way of life by people coming here. And I want people to see that there's thousands of Shagofas, maybe millions of Shagofas and, and her family that are out there that are struggling in countries that to some extent our government have wrecked. Has Our government has done a lot of, I, I think probably Shagofa's family feels that America's government helped for 20 years but at the same time, in the end, it doesn't look like we helped enough and we've caused a lot of problems in a lot of countries. And my personal opinion is we morally owe it to families like Shagofa's family to help them come to a place where they're safe, because to some extent we made where they lived unsafe. So and people don't recognize that that's our government policy, but it is our government policy. It's been our government policy for decades. So I believe we have a moral obligation to help to change our government's policies and to reach out to families like this and help them get here or get to Canada or get somewhere safe. Anything else, Dave? Yeah, that's it. I mean, yeah, um, I'm busy. I'm, I'm ready. I'm needing to get to work. You know, we've got yeah. some stuff and um, let's make it happen. Yeah. I want to, um, I want to see progress and um, yeah. And again, like um, I'm getting contacted um, yesterday, I had like several people, um, some friends of Shagofa and her friends um, who have more family or their family, like, ha hasn't been able to get out, right? They're waiting at the airport or something and they couldn't get out. They're like, how can, how can, how can we help? And I actually like, you know, some people want to give up, but I actually, last night I had an idea. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I have an idea. It's not going to, this extra route I, I'm thinking about, it's not going to happen before the, it's a different route that. Um, but it's not going to happen before, the, like in a before the U.S. leaves, which is just in two days. But it's a different route that um, I think could help people. But they're going to need um, a passport, a strong outside advocate, and some funds. And um, the best way I can help is probably working through a long-term advocate like Shagofa. For example, she's the one who's taking care of her family. She's long-term committed to to making them, you know, making seeing it through. Um, for me to directly help someone who I don't know and I doesn't have long term support, that's more challenging, you know. So um, yeah, I'm kind of focusing on more just um, um, a network of people that you know are are abroad who who are in the position to really support their families long term, and um, yeah, I think there could be possibilities of some alternative routes that might be more challenging and more costly than this route we did this past week. But that's the name of the game. It's like. I hate to say this, but like, because we're, you know, you and I both do Tesla and investing channels, like there's certain times with like, especially even with investments, like you miss it, you miss the squeeze or, you know, you got in too late, like two days too late. You knew you should have pulled the trigger or you didn't, right? It was like timing is so crucial. And that's, this is one of the things that just happened this past week. It was one of those timing things where, where it was brewing for a long time. And in, in a period of a week, it just, you know, all blew up. Yeah. And it's a different world we live in for sure. One other lesson I took away from what you described. So I've traveled a lot, but I think you've traveled a lot more than I have. And I really encourage people, 
Yeah. There, there's this thing called the overview effect. People say when you get launched into orbit, you see Earth from up above, that somehow that gives you this perspective on the world and we, you see that we're all one. And I don't, I've never believed that the overview effect was real. I believe the overview effect is really what Dave experienced. He traveled the world. He actually, rather than looking down on people from above, Dave actually went and saw where they lived. And I think don't just travel to some fancy resort that's, uh, you know, an up when all, you know, all in resort where everything's inside the resort and you don't go outside. Go out and see where people live in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in, in poorer countries. Go out and see what life is like. And that will give you perspective that will make you understand why people like Shagofa matter. Yeah. I mean, one last story here. I know because you, you're pretty flexible with time. I'm good. Shagofa, do you need to go actually? Do you have work or something? Yeah. Sorry. I have to leave. Um, Thank you so much. Okay. See you later. Thank you, Shagofa. Right. Um, so um, I actually went to Afghanistan. Um, right after the U.S. Um, um, did their invasion after 9-11. So, and I was actually already in Pakistan for, for a couple of weeks, just um, seeing what I could do there. And um, I didn't know you can even go into Afghanistan. And um, I found out that there were UN flights and barely anybody was going. But actually, it was like, um, it wasn't as dangerous as people were thinking it to be, actually. It's pretty calm there. But I remember I was like, I spent like maybe you know, a good week or 10 days there. And um, there was no government because the Taliban had fell, there was no, basically, but it was pretty calm. And I remember I went to the outskirts of these like really just more poor areas of Kabul. And uh, for some reason I found myself like being able to get into houses. It was like, I forget the, it was just a crazy sequence, but I was able to like with my interpreter, like find myself just sitting down in these like, houses that were just like kind of makeshift houses they were more in a poor area and talking to these families with my interpreter and seeing their kids go in and out of these like kind of yeah it's just really you know no sanitation and then seeing the kids play outside these three-year-olds and four-year-olds and then playing together with them and like getting that connection that and then meeting other people also in the city because the cities are I mean, this, this is so diverse of a, like in LA, you have Bel, Bel Air and Beverly Hills, but you also have Compton and, you know, the hood or whatever. It's same thing with every city. So it, even in Kabul, you have the ritzy areas, you know, and then you have the, the rundown areas. And so even talking with all facets of society. So I would go down to the low, I go down to the top and the middle. So I'd talk to the people on the street, talk to the educated people. And from that, I'm like, um, and then doing that same thing in Iran. And doing that same thing as much as possible, even though it's harder in North Korea and in all these different places, it just completely broke all of my stereotypes of people in general. You know, it's like there's there's really not much difference from, for example, Shagofa. She grew up in one of those rural towns, probably in like a makeshift house with, you know, very little sanitation. There's really not much difference between her and an, an American teenager or American college student, you know? Right. Like you talk with her and it's like, it's like you're just you're talking to someone like, you know, from, from North America, you know, right. she's one of those kids that like I met kind of like, you know, like 20 years ago, who was in kind of rundown housing, playing outside in the dirt and our, our prejudice or our, our kind of bias is, oh, that's a, a poor country, a poor kid. And those people, they just want to live um, have better ec economic means. They just want to live better, right? But the reality is, if you if you listen to Shagofa and her mindset, she would have been probably better off economically in a different place, meaning um, she could have done well in anywhere she went. But she actually came to the U.S. She actually had a crazy story, but she actually, um, yeah, had to traverse a lot of stuff because she believed in opportunity and freedom. And the 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 right to have a life, actually. The right to think something and to try to do something about it, right? And that is, to me, the, the shining light in the world. The people who will say, okay, fine, you know, living nicer is better, better, but ultimately, like, I'm willing to put my life down at, on, at stake and for other people, my family and others, to give, to, to be able to, to have a right to say what I want to say, to do what I want to do, to help people and to make a difference. But to me, that's part of the story of this whole thing too, you know? Like, yeah, yeah it's like, 
some of these families they're young kids they wouldn't they might not have had a chance to to and hopefully they will have a chance everything's in in limbo right now but hopefully they'll have a chance a, a better opportunity and this is like that's hope to me you know as yeah. much as there's bias and discrimination and whatever prejudice and, and indifference as well or just apathy there's also this other side where we're getting it done one one at a time you know one one girl you know one you know one teenager or whatever um yeah one Read. family one one yeah. one child yep yeah okay yeah. well thank you dave i really appreciate you speaking with me and uh yeah. and for you know what you've done uh, i think you're a hero I've always liked you, but now I now I have to say, wow, this is like over the top. What you've done is really, really special. And I almost look back to the everyday astronaut interview with Elon Musk, where he said we have to innovate with extreme urgency. And you've been acting with extreme urgency for the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I seriously want to emphasize like any little thing actually has helped. Meaning any retweet that anyone has done, any DM that someone has done for me, I've gotten hundreds, hundreds of people that have given like little things here and there. So like you know, pulling it all together. It's like, yeah, I'm telling you, man, like, like what's happening, like on platforms and relationships is just, I, I, and that's part of the thing is I felt like, okay, I have a YouTube channel and Twitter audience. Like I, I would feel more guilty if I didn't do anything. And you what do we saying? have this for? Yeah. And I have experience too in like visiting these countries. So I, I understand like these are real people real lives, you know? So I'm like, ah, oh, you gotta do something. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, man. Well, thanks very much. I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. All right. Take care, Warren. Talk to bye you bye. later. Bye.